In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. If there's a word that we've heard a lot in this last year, perhaps more than other years in our life, one of the words that we've heard more of this year is shortage. We're living in a world where the reality of shortages has become unavoidably real. All kind of shortages, there's labor shortages in general. Then we hear about specific professions where whether they be physicians or pilots, I hear we are tens of thousands of pilots short in our country. Of course, there's all kind of personal, personal shortages. With inflation as high as it is, we can feel a shortage of money. I think if we're all honest, we can confess a shortage of patience. Sometimes we feel like there's a shortage even of time. Imagine our stress if we think something as basic in the creation as time, we feel that there is a shortage. Then, of course, now we hear of more threats of shortages coming down the road, perhaps. In some places, food. In some places, even a shortage of water. Shortage after shortage after shortage. We hear about this. No matter what the shortage is, we are either insane or one of the reactions to that shortage is fear. You can't have a shortage of something that you need and not feel fear. You can deny it. You can repress it. You can try to twist it around, but if there's something that you think you need and there's a prospect of not having enough of it, it automatically makes us fearful. It's actually a God-given instinct that when we need something, we feel very intrinsically, there is something I need. We feel it. We don't just think it. We feel it. But with a shortage, there's another process. That is that we have a fear. But because of our fear of something, that there is perhaps a shortage of something we need, now our minds are drawn to that thing to a very great degree. We have a heightened focus on that thing, even though at the moment we might have enough of it, <coughs> but the threat of a shortage brings our mind to it to such a degree that sometimes we can't think of other things. It's a terrible combination, fear and a heightened focus on the thing that we're afraid that may be coming. And what happens when we have those things come together, which we do every time we perceive a shortage if we're not thinking in the right way? We start to argue. There's a better way to do it, and if people would listen to me or my political philosophy, we would not have this problem. If only that person or this person were the president, we wouldn't have these problems. And so we start to divide. We argue, there's dissension. And in that division and dissension, we grow in our frustration, we grow in our anger. If we let that go uninhibited, we lose all hope. Does it sound familiar? If not you, you hear it in the people around you. Well, the gospel, as it always does, because of what it is, it is good news. And today, the good news is how we can deal with the threat of shortages. Now, maybe, maybe when you think about the feeding of the 5,000 from a few loaves and a couple of fish, maybe what comes to your mind is not shortage, but abundance, as it should. Perhaps when you leave or go down the aisle in church, you look up on your right on the way back, and you'll see the first icon of the panel there on the right is Christ feeding the 5,000. 5,000 men plus the women and children. What is that? 10, 15, 20,000 people? More than can fit in the Van Andel Arena downtown. And they're out in the wilderness, and the disciples say, Master, it's late. Send them away. There's no food. We're in the middle of nowhere, and there are thousands of people that are about to get very hungry. Send them away. 
You and I think of maybe a shortage when we're driving down the road on a road trip. And maybe you're in the middle of a very uninhabited place and next stop, 47 miles. You think, wow, can we, can we make it 47 miles till we get our next snack or meal? These are perhaps tens of thousands of people with no food. Well, there was a little bit. Five loaves, two fish for a thousand people. Talk about a shortage. But when Jesus hears the request of the disciples, send them away, let them go buy food in the villages. Jesus turns that back on them. And this is where we can be so instructed if our eyes and our ears and our hearts are open to see and hear and understand who Jesus is and what he does. Jesus says to them, give them something to eat. You give them. They don't need to go away. You have food. The disciples are looking at these few loaves they have, looking at these massive people. Talk about a shortage. But listen to what Jesus does. He knows about the size of the crowd. He knows the exact number. In fact, he knows the exact number of hairs on the head of everyone in the crowd. And he knows the exact amount of ounces of bread and fish that they have gathered together. Barely enough to feed maybe a dozen. And Jesus says to the disciples, bring it to me. Bring what? Bring the bread, bring the fish, bring it to me. In other words, bring your shortage to me. We're the ones with the fear. We're the ones like the disciples seeing a shortage are hyper-focused on the thing that we're about to run out of. And because of our fear and our heightened awareness of it, we go in that cycle of division and frustration. And perhaps they were even angry with Jesus. Why are you wasting our time? Send them away, Lord. They have miles to walk. You want us to bring you a few loaves? Yes. Jesus says to them, bring it to me. This is the choice that all of us are faced with. We've always been faced with it, but with more shortage at least that we're talking about and thinking about and being told about. Maybe it's time for us to rethink how we respond to a potential shortage. What do people of faith do? People of faith don't encounter shortages. Let me say that again. People of faith do not encounter shortages. Now, if they do, there is a shortage of one thing, faith, which means they're not being people of faith. Think of whatever shortages that you have been hearing about, that you've been aware of, that maybe perhaps you have been frightened about. And all of us today should think about how we have brought or have not brought our faith to the prospect of a shortage. You see, faith is trust. It's not a set of ideas. It's not a theological formula. It is the placement of our trust for things that we need, and we place it somewhere. Now, all too often, we place our faith in ourselves. And trusting in ourselves and seeing a shortage of something that we can't control. We can't control the clock. Can't control sometimes the amount of money in the bank account. We actually have a lot more control of that than we think, but that's for another sermon. We sometimes think we can't control our level of patience. And we certainly can't, any one of us, control the global food supply. And so what do we do when we put our faith in ourselves? We're afraid. And again, we may not feel it. We may bury it. We bury it in kind of anger, all kinds of things. But it's there. But people of faith don't do that. At least people of faith in God. People of faith in God 
know who God is, know what God does, including what we heard in today's gospel. When there is a shortage, he says very simply, bring it to me. Don't bring me nothing, by the way. Bring me what you have. God involves all of us in every aspect of our salvation. Bring me what you have, even a shortage of faith. Bring it to me. And then we watch what he does. Imagine those crowds. They stayed because of what they were hearing from Jesus. They were feeding on the words coming out of his mouth. But perhaps their kids first started to feel those hunger pains. Maybe you feel them right now. But they started to feel them. And with nowhere to get food, perhaps that fear started to grow. And imagine the crowd watching from probably very far away, most of them, see Jesus lifting up his eyes to heaven, blessing the food, and then distributing it. Those five loaves and those two fish, handing out loaf after loaf after loaf after loaf after loaf after loaf. <coughs> that by the time they're done feeding these thousands and thousands of people, they're now collecting up the baskets. I want you to look when you see that icon when you leave. The most prominent feature of it are the baskets. The leftovers. Everything that was there after Jesus multiplied those five loaves, those two fish. There wasn't a shortage. He didn't meet their need. He super exceedingly met their need. And he gave them an abundance. And imagine that their response to go from hunger to now be so full, we can't have any more. Sometimes we go to our relatives' houses, we know that feeling of, I can't have another bite. The gratitude they had for having their hunger met. The joy of having gone from fear to now plenty. And the peace. The peace that we can only have when we know our needs are being met. That's how faithful people respond to shortages. They have gratitude, they have joy, they have peace. Why? Because they place their trust not in themselves, not in a governmental system, not in any other person other than the person of Jesus Christ. And because of our faith in him, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be hyper-focused. We don't have to argue. We can be joyful. We can be gracious. We can be peaceful. So the question that's put before us today is how are we responding to shortages? How have we been? And how can we? Especially after hearing today's gospel. The reality is we might all be tempted to answer in different ways. Some of us might go out from here with the same lack of faith that we walked in with. Well, St. Paul has a message for us this morning. We heard it in today's epistle. The very beginning of today's epistle, which comes out of the beginning of St. Paul's letter to his first letter to the Corinthians, is that there be no dissension and division among you, speaking to us. He doesn't want us divided. He doesn't want some of us having faith and others not having faith. He wants us all together in faith in Jesus Christ. That's where he began today's reading. And the reading goes on as he's addre addressing divisions over baptism in the early Corinthian church. But I want to focus on the, where today's reading ended. After saying that, you know, don't be a uh, part of the party of Apollos or other people or Paul, Christ is not divided. He ends with this. He says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And listen carefully to this. And not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now that's a ridiculous statement. If you don't realize how ridiculous it is, Look at Jesus up on the cross and tell me where you see power. Jesus on the cross is the ultimate image, the ultimate icon of powerlessness. 
The power of the cross is not that Jesus has some great power that he put himself there. He made himself powerless. He offered himself in weakness. Why? So that through God's power, that might be how our salvation comes about. When we talk about the power of the cross, it's oxymoronic. It's ultimate in irony, the power of the cross. That's saying the, the fierceness of a nice little breeze. The power of the cross is in weakness, but not just weakness, period. Weakness and trust in God and God's power. Jesus went to the cross in the weakness of trust. The weakness of powerlessness. The weakness of mortality. The immortal one goes to death. Because he looked at his father and gave his father all trust and all obedience and all love. My brothers and sisters, that's the image for us for how we face shortages. We could respond with our own personal exercise of power. We're going to store up. We're going to save. We're going to plan. Planning is fine, but it won't save you. I told somebody who told me they've been storing food up for the coming food shortage. I said, you told the wrong guy. Because <laughs> I know where I'm coming for food now. And by the way, I have a lot of other people that could be hungry. I'm going to tell them where to go too. So if you're storing food, don't tell me where it is. I'm bringing everybody with me. No, we don't respond to shortage with fear. That's for faithless people. That's for people who have not seen that icon and have met that Jesus. That Jesus says, no matter what powerlessness you have, I have enough. Bring your shortage to me. And he'll take care of the rest. So whatever shortages you have or are afraid of, money, time, status, respect, position, even food or water. We can live in fear, we can hyper-focus on it, and we can join the world in the march to a hellish life trying to save ourselves. Or we can turn to Christ and have fear. I'm sorry, not have fear, have faith, and lose our fear, leave our fear behind. We've lived with much too fear already, We've given too much attention to the world's versions of shortages, and we have wasted too much time on all that. It's time for us to be people of faith. Faith in Christ, in the Christ who always gives everything that we need. That's the choice that we've always had. It's the choice we have today. So let's choose well to be people of faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.